It's four o'clock on a Monday, and you know what that means, don't you? It's time for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live! Woohoo! Baby! This week, starring very special guest star, Mr. Greg Carroza! Yeah, all the way from beautiful Albuquerque, New Mexico. And thank you, fake fan. Thank you, fake audience. And hello, live guest. How are you, Greg? Hi, Michael. Good to see you. Did I pronounce your last name right? It's Carosa? Perfect. That's it. That's because we used to have somebody on staff named Anthony Coza, so I practiced the back half of your name for many years. Oh, okay. <laughs> so uh, this week we're going to talk about the top 10 reasons this taxi member, in other words, Greg, uh, improved his success rate. And um, let me say a quick hello to our friends in the chat room, uh, Stan Morris, Lamar Franklin, McCall, Deb and Keith McCall, Carl Wurzbach, Dean Kataska, Mojo Bone, Jay Williams, Mark Hemley, Wendell and Landers, or as we like to call her, Wendy. Um, <laughs> let's see, who else? Uh, Funky Freddy, Dean Turner, Bob Gunderfeld. Anyway, Robbie Hancock, hello. So remember, was it last week's show where I said I needed a, a volunteer to be interviewed on this show? And I really didn't know what I was opening myself up to, you know? I mean could have been a little dangerous. We've had like maybe just one or two serial killers as guests on the show. <laughs> uh, you never know what you're gonna get, but I think we got extremely lucky this week. Um, I asked people to submit a letter and, and Greg sent this letter, which I'm gonna read to you now. I'd be fantastic. Oh <laughs> yeah, it's a, good, it's a good letter. It sets the whole thing okay. up. Um, I think it's a great letter, actually. I'd be a great guest, fantastic guest on Taxi TV as I feel I'm the most improved member year over year. That's great. That's kind of the thing I was looking for. I've been a member since 2016, but prior to the rally in 2018, I floundered with the same old story. I tried to fit material I already had completed into taxi submissions, and I failed miserably. I received only a handful of forwards and many dozens of returns. Ouch. In 2018, I was extremely close to quitting my membership. Um, but since attending last year's rally, I've written 114 instrumental tracks, gotten 92 forwards, and have signed 54 tracks across five different libraries. I left this year's rally with the goal of writing 200 new tracks over the next year. And so far, in the 15 days since returning, I've written 12 tracks and seven are already signed in two different libraries. I am primarily doing pop, EDM, and other electronic dance-oriented genres like Deep House, Future Bass, and Trance, as well as many styles of hip-hop, and most recently, Urban Tension. I also do solo piano and orchestral stuff. In addition, I've met several other members at past rallies that I've collaborated with, um, co-write, produce, and mix. I'm a 30-year-plus keyboardist, composer, engineer, mixer, producer. I think I know quite a bit technical information on the recording process, as well as composition. Um, I do most of my work in the box, Mac using Logic or Digital Performer. Uh, if you're interested, link below to my taxi, uh, some of my taxi forwarded yet still unsigned tracks. Um, and Bria, do you want to put that in the chat room, the, the link, so people can go hear Greg's stuff? Um, to sum up, while I'm nowhere near at the top of my career yet, I can surely attest to the fact that you have to keep learning from your returns, keep writing, keep improving, don't take it personally, and you will very slowly and incrementally start to see progress and success. At this year's rally, I especially enjoyed meeting members with less success than me and trying to impart what I've learned so far to them. Um, I'm in Albuquerque, New Mexico, a very unique place in the USA. Um, I, I thought that was a great letter. I mean, it's you're like the the you know one of the like the image of what I started, the person I started this company for. Your, your wow. attitude is like I can do this. It's going to take some work, and here's how I can improve. And so that's well, like I said, like I said when I wrote that, it didn't it didn't start out that way. Right. Uh, well, that it, it, and it took time to get to that for sure. I think it wouldn't start out that way for a lot of people. You know, a, a lot of people think that just having great music is enough. You know, that they're going to have a great song or a great bunch of songs and join Taxi and bam, the, you know, the pearly gates are going to open up and the money's yeah. going to start pouring in. But yet every one of our successful members, 
has told us this story almost like exactly like you have. So mm -hmm. I, I think you're a great guest because you're on the rise um, and people sometimes give me a little bit of grief when I have, you know, these hundred thousand dollar or more earning members on the show. It's like, oh yeah, you're just picking out the, the super talented guys or the super lucky guys. Well, here's a guy that like you guys, you know, he didn't get it right in the beginning and then he kind of stepped back and looked at it. And now he's getting it right. And that's what Greg is going to do for you today is share his, his, the things he's learned and the steps that he's taken to start to see success. So yay, uh, I'm really grateful that you're taking the time to do this. And by the way, how was your Thanksgiving? Oh, it was, it was uh, inside, it was great. We actually had some rare snow here in Albuquerque during the day, so wow, everyone was snowed in for Thanksgiving. It was exciting. Oh man, um, yeah. how long have you lived in Al Albuquerque? Uh, just about uh, a little more than three years now. And where did you move there from? Phil Philadelphia. Ah. So, okay, I'm going to surprise you now because I'll bet you we know some people in common. Remember Bricklin, the group Bricklin? Oh, sure. Okay. They became Martin's Dam. And mm -hmm. I actually ended up producing some stuff for them. I flew out. I think their parents had a house in Conshohocken. I can't say Conshohocken. Is that that's right? That's right. Conshohocken, yeah. That's Which right. is a suburb of Philly. Mm -hmm. And I remember they had a Mackie eight bus console and three A debts and a decent little compliment, you know, probably four or five fifty sevens, a four fourteen, um, I think an eighty seven that they rented, a couple of Elisa's reverb units. I sat in their parents' garage in the middle of winter with a coat and a hat on, uh, and they were in their parents' living room, which happened to have a, a wood beam peak ceiling, uh, like a river rock fireplace, and one wall of glass and some big throw rugs. Made one of the best recordings I've ever done in my life on three A deaths with the Mackie eight bus console. Wow! Um, in beautiful downtown Conshohocken. So Conshohocken. <laughs> everybody knows the Bricklands. Yeah. Anyway. Um, that goes back a little bit, a little ways. Yeah, sure. that was probably around 95 or 96, I think. Okay. Uh, and mm -hmm. I know, I knew them as Martin's Dam, but they were Bricklin. And they were actually signed, I think, to A&M or something for a year or two before they became Martin's Dam. Um, mm -hmm. They had puffy hair with lots of hairspray when they were signed. <laughs> I got them in the hippie stage where their hair had gotten long and scraggly. Um, <laughs> Okay, so let's start going through the top 10 things that you've done that have helped you become more successful in making music that gets forwarded and then ultimately signed. Number okay. one on your list is the Road Rally. Tell us about that. Absolutely. Well, you've talked about it many times on Taxi TV. Um, other members have talked about it. And it's, it's pretty much the linchpin the, the beginning of the success that I've had. Um, I missed, like you, uh, like you just asked me, I moved from Philadelphia to Albuquerque in 2016. It, was, it wasn't long after I first joined and I wasn't able to come to the rally. I actually drove across the country during the rally that year. So I missed it. Um, so that's why I spent like a whole extra year doing nothing. But once I showed up to the rally, um, I found that number one, there's so many other people that you have so much in common with, and there's so much optimism and camaraderie among everybody, which is really, really helpful. You know, it's very easy to, um, to you know, sit down at your computer or your recorder, or whatever you do, keyboard, your guitar, whatever, alone, and think, um, just I do this. You know, nobody else <laughs> does this, right? But there's thousands and thousands and thousands of people who, who aspire to do the same thing. But, um, but it's not competitive at all at the rally. It's just like a big, it's just like a big friendship gathering. It's, it's fantastic. I, but, um, I, I don't know how it became so incredibly helpful and friendly like it is, but I'm certainly glad that it did. But yeah, those are, that's the hallmark of the road rally, I think, is that pay it forward, I'll help anybody attitude, even from the, like, the most successful members that are making multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars a year will help somebody who doesn't have a clue. Right. And, and it's no, that's, that's exactly how it is. And it's, it's, that's amazing. And I didn't expect that in any way, you know, I mean, not that I knew what to expect at all the first time 
that I came out to the rally, but I really didn't expect that. You know, I expected to do what I might normally do in a crowd of people, which is stand about as far away from the activity as possible, um, you know, to attempt to listen, but uh, just kind of absorb what I can and move on. And that's not the experience at all. I, I would be sitting do, there right next to you because I'm that guy like at yeah, a party I, or other people's conventions. I'm, you know, hugging the wall in the ballroom probably. But that's a mistake because you, if you do that, you're really not getting the benefit of what the whole event is all about. Um, but really, you know, learning, learning in all of the, um, the, the driver's ed classes, as you call them, and, um, and, and going to all the listening panels, which is really, uh, really important to hear um, what others are doing and how they're doing it and what the panel says about it. You know, that's, that's really important too. You know, I spent so much time uh, when I started out just thinking um, I knew what was appropriate for the listing. Of course, I was absolutely wrong, <laughs> but I thought I, I thought I knew, you know, I thought, hey, I've got this, that, that could work here, and it didn't. But, but going to the listening panels really helps you understand more about um, what others are doing, how they're doing it, and what the industry people think of it, you know. And I think you mentioned that during one of the panels this past year that, um, that the level, the quality of the work is really, really, really rising. Um, you know, you, you, I think you said um, you, you were hoping none of them suck. I think you said that. Yeah. <laughs> something to that effect. Um, and, uh, and absolutely none of them did. I mean, everything was great. I was sitting there. I was starting to think, geez, I hope they don't play mine because uh, most of these are way better and I'm going to look foolish. You but, know, uh, uh, in years past, we would actually have a little stash of good music to play. It was from taxi members, but that was our emergency hmm. stash because it can ruin a panel. If you play three or four that are just like really, really bad, I'm not talking like beginner level, I'm talking sub beginner. Uh, and, and we do pick the stuff randomly, but we always had an emergency stash and maybe twice in 23 years did we have to pull that stuff out and play it just to kind of re reinvigorate the room. But this year, somebody in the staff said, do we need to you know, bring a stash? Of, I, we call them peppers to pepper them in. And I said, no, you know what? Uh, it's last year, the year before, it's always random, you know, the, um, right. and now, the randomness is proved by the fact that we put it up on a nine foot by 12 foot screen in the ballroom. Every big, people used to doubt the randomness when we were just grabbing CDs out of a box. But now when they see a number come up on the screen and that's what we play, it is random. And you're right, absolutely. Even though the stuff was randomly pulled, it could have been terrible. But even the worst stuff that was played was probably B level. And that ain't oh, so yeah. bad. No. Nope. So, it yeah. was good, and there's something to learn. There's something to learn from everything, um, even if it's not the style of music that you do. Or um, it still, you still can learn from you know whatever the feedback is from from the panel. So that's that's definitely helpful. Um, and then of course there's the the mentor lunches and the mentor one-on-one uh, -on -one sessions, which you know again I think it takes some time to really. You, you really need to do some, uh, some research into who all the mentors are and who, who the appropriate person for you to talk to is. But once you pick the right one, you know, they, basically they become your friend. Uh, you know, they, it's, uh, that's another amazing uh, thing you can. And, you know, once you sit down, randomly sit down with you at lunch, and then throughout the rest of the, the weekend, you run into them, say hi, have a drink, talk more about things. It's, it just it can't really get any better than that. You just there is no access. I don't know of any other event. You have the kind of access to the kind of people you do at the at the rally, um, you know, and that it actually genuinely helps you. You know, because you can ask specific questions, get a real answer that you can apply to what you're doing. Yeah, it's funny they they don't withhold the good stuff. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's. Uh... Yeah, they're very forthcoming. I, I don't know, may, maybe it's the drugs we slip into the coffee or something. <laughs> it's all the rock star drink. That's yeah, there you go. Sure you, there you this go. week's sponsor exactly. is Rockstar. Uh -huh. um, I remember about a day in, or no, it was the Thursday night during registration. This year I hired a, a gentleman who is a, a, an expert in his field. He's been... Uh, bringing in sponsors for conventions and magazines for many years. 
Uh, and we've known each other and we've danced around the idea of him coming to work for a taxi to sell some sponsorships. I finally pulled the trigger on that this year. And, and he came up to me at some point and he said, I'm overwhelmed by this line of people. There are just hundreds upon hundreds of people standing in line for hours, you know, through the hotel lobby. I mean, we, in years past, we actually routed people out to the parking garage. Um, and he said, I don't know, I'm really troubled by that. And I said, you know what? That's the difference. That line is the difference between the taxi road rally and other large scale conventions that feel less welcoming, less warm, less helpful and more corporate. He said, you know, at, at this other really big convention, you could just go stick your driver's license under a scanner and automatically prints your badge. You don't even have to stand in line. And I said, right. our line is the secret sauce. First of oh, all, yeah. we don't force anybody to be in it. People show up early because they want to get first crack at a good mentor, but they mm. don't have to be there. And I, I, you know, when you stand in line, it's like waiting in line at a big rock concert. You're going to talk about, oh, did you see that other concert? Or I love the guitar player in this band. You build friendships with the people that are around you. And that's oh, what makes the whole weekend so much friendlier is you've made friends before the convention actually starts. Absolutely. I, I'm, I'm friends with the first person I, that was in line that I walked up to behind three years ago. There you um, go. And you just you just don't know that that's going to happen, but then it does. Yeah. And it's great. Just got to bring some earplugs if you're going to be in that room for a while. Uh, it, oh, it can get right. loud. <laughs> yeah. We call that the, the Disneyland zigzag line room, for yeah. lack of a better way to describe it. And for those of you who've never been to a road rally, we had to have somewhere to house you know, the first night is usually somewhere around 800 people that come in just the, you know, like early registration on Thursday evening. And uh, so we put them in a room that's like a very large classroom or a small ballroom that would normally hold a couple hundred people maybe. Uh, and probably holds 350 when you've zigzagged them. And we use skinny little tables as our stanchions. And yeah, it's hundreds of people all talking about making music. And it's pretty cool. Um, so, uh, let's see if there's anything that we didn't talk about. No, I think you covered everything, the optimism, the camaraderie. Um, so your number two suggestion for finding success is focus on what you do best, um, uh, but still try to improve in other areas. Would you ex right. expound on that, please? Sure. Well, so that was kind of something that, um, I, I would guess a lot of other members make this kind of mistake. You kind of think I can do, uh, I can do so many different things. Um, and the truth is, is that's not a good idea. Um, because you need to really focus on one thing or, or a couple of related things to really get good at that, at that, at those things. Um, and really, you know, listen to the examples, and we're going to talk about this a little later on, but, in, you know, in listening and getting better at the one thing. So that's what's kind of m most important. I mean, I've, I've been personally focusing a whole lot more over the past year on uh, the le electronic music, uh, EDM tempo types of things. Um, and it's just, you know, I, I like doing that. I felt like I was doing it better, so I started focusing on it a lot harder and I feel like I'm doing it even better. Now, the, the other side of that is, like, like you said there, um, what I don't like to do, though, is too much of the same thing because um, I personally get stuck in a rut. I, I, have, I do have a deal with one library who wants me to write um, at least five tracks at a time in the same style. And I, I can't lie to you. I, I know for a fact the fifth one is not quite as good as the first one. Um, you know, I'm just running out of ideas and I'm trying to do them in a timely fashion as well. So not taking months to do that. So, um, so I, so I find that if I switch up to something else, so if I'm doing electronic music, maybe I switch up, do a hip hop track, um, next, that is a whole different thing. Lots of different types of ideas that create that. And then I can go back, back to the, the EDM tracks and have a different, um, have new ideas, have a, you know, a rejuvenated perspective on it. So it's not being so narrow all the time that this is all you do, but just being narrow a lot of the time so you improve. 
What was your main genre uh, before you got into doing up-tempo, dancey, beat, poppy, or electronic stuff? That, were you like an acoustic guitar country guy or what? Oh, no. No, no. I don't <laughs> play guitar. I just play keyboard. But no, honestly, um, as I said, in the, you know, as you read in my, in my letter to you, the, the, when I joined, um, it, was, it was based off of uh, co-writing and producing a whole lot of uh, songs over like a 10-year period. A lot of that was pop, R&B, some hip hop music as well. Actually, almost none of it was, almost none of it was electronic type of dance uh, tempo things. Um, but it just turned out that almost none of that really fit, um, as we've discussed. It just it just didn't work. And so you know, I kind of made a 180, especially moving to Albuquerque. And now I I basically sit alone at my computer all day every day. Um, you know, I focus on what I can do without. Um, without needing others. Now, there's times, there's plenty of times when um, I, I, I get other members who I've met to maybe record some vocal snippets or play some guitar because I can only plunk out some very simple stuff uh, and things like that. And, you know, as you know, the, now we can share anything electronically. It's, it's, you know, it's like we're sitting next to each other even if we're completely across the world. You know, I've gotten, I've, I've worked with people on tracks in London, you know, it doesn't matter. Um, it, it, you know, you just send wave files back and forth. It's simple. It, so, it's still mind-blowing to me, but you're well, right, it, it is. is simple. <laughs> oh, it is. I mean, I'm, I definitely go back to tape days, and so the, what we can do now is just, is just amazing. Um, but it, it, really, it, really doesn't, it really doesn't matter where you are you can do anything, you know, that, that's why I don't listen to anybody who says you've got to be at the, at the epicenter, the physically at the epicenters of the music industries like LA, New York, Nashville. Um, you really don't, you really don't have to. I would you say anywhere. the, the vast majority of our successful members don't live in one of the music capitals. They, they live all over the place. Uh, sometimes I, we've got one member, uh, I can't remember his name at the moment. I'm drawing a blank, but he lives like, on the island of Ibiza, off the coast of Spain. Oh, wow. I mean, uh, another one lives in uh, Crete, I believe, and we've got members all over Asia, South America, and, and it is amazing how, I think the road rally and to some extent the, the chat room on Taxi TV has built this global network of people helping people. And you know what the cool thing is? Everybody gets it. Because mm -hmm. they've been to the road rally, because they watch Haxi TV, they're not just like dopey dreamers, like, oh, I wish I had a career in the music industry. They become focused very quickly. They go, oh, what this guy's saying makes sense. sense. Now I've, I can see the mission, and, and they get a clearer picture of what they need to do, and the network is there to help them. Yeah. It's pretty cool. And you, and you do have to do it. I mean, you just can't, you can't wing it. Right. That, does, that, is, that isn't going to work. Um, and you can't expect it overnight, as you've mentioned many times. Um, you know, too many people think that it's just going to happen. Things are just going to happen. Too many people think that the first time you <laughs> get like a forward or, or even more, uh, you know, you get contacted, you know, from someone back from that forward, like this is, this is the top. This, that, is, that is scratching the bottom. Right. You know, you have just, you just got to open the door. That's where you just got to open the door. Um, but it's it is hard to realize that without without doing it. It really is. It's hard to um, you know. I mean, as we've already mentioned, so many people say that kind of stuff over and over at the rally on Taxi TV. Um, it's it is difficult for that to sink in until you really do it. I think we had somebody in the chat room on last week's episode when uh, Michael Lloyd and Rob Shirelli were here, and the person's question to them. I think I'm remembering this right. He said, like, I've been forwarded 17 times over eight years, and I haven't I gotten that. a call from anybody. And I, I didn't want to break the guy's heart by saying, you know, 17 times is just scratching the bottom, as you say, you know, it, it's yeah. a start. It's a positive sign, but you should probably be making more music, submitting more frequently, and get that number up, because it is a numbers game. You have to have quality. You have to understand what they're looking for, but in addition to that, it's a numbers game. You can't wait for inspiration to strike and then no. send something in and then three months later send something else in. 
Uh, it's, no, I, I'm, and I probably didn't mention this at all, but I'm now to the point where I'm looking at the taxi listings every day, daily. That's how I start my day. Uh, what's new today? What and and kind of reorganize and reprioritize those that I'm going to submit to, at, on a daily basis. Um, right. When I started out, I thought I could do that. Like um, I said, I thought I thought I'd do it monthly. Yeah, that was that didn't make any sense. It's a daily thing. Daily. Uh, and the industry is moving much quicker now. We're actually mm -hmm. getting ready to have a meeting uh, with the A and R department here about what can we do. Um, there are more situations where people need music much quicker. Uh, and obviously, Taxi Dispatch was originally created for that, um, and then all of Taxi became about being quicker, and now it's even quicker again, where mm. libraries need stuff from us in 24 hours because they're pitching to a show and they need it in 24 hours. So we're gonna find a way to make that work, um, but you know we've gotta do that to stay relevant and stay productive for our members. Uh, what did you do before Taxi? Uh, have you always earned a living making music full-time? Oh, nope, not at all. I used to be a computer programmer about 15 years wow. or so. Yeah, but um, I just kind of burned out of that. I, I got to the point where I'd work 75, 80 hours a, a, a week, and um, I had little children at the time, and uh, it, was, it was not really what I thought it was going to be when I got started. So I just, I dropped it entirely. I called it a retirement from that industry. And uh, that's when I started doing music. Uh, well, I'm glad you time. did. And, and funny enough, I just said this to either a staff member or my wife in the last week. I'm aware of a, a lot of our members are programmers. Uh, they either write software, they build websites, you know, they're all dancing around this core. And, and then they become full-time musicians because I guess the discipline that you need to write code or develop a website is not that different from the discipline you need to create music. I think there's just some, actually, I just think there's some link in the, between the sciences, the math, the sciences and, and music. Yeah. Um, there's just quite a big correlation. Many, many people um, who do one of those things do all of those things. Um, so, that, you know, there's got to be something to that. Because um, I used to think that's what I wanted to do was just do math all the time. That, that didn't make sense, but it, it was fun. Math, math is fun, and that's, that's weird, but I think so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's weird for about 80% of us, the 20% of you guys who think math is fun. You guys totally get that. Uh, yeah. For somebody that got Ds in algebra all the time, math, not that fun. <laughs> just not that fun. That. <laughs> that's okay. Algebra is not really that helpful, but that's okay. Yeah, I, I've always found that... I can guess a number, you know, like do a projection in my head, walking down the hall to go out to the restroom or something here at work and have that number probably faster than our chief financial officer can using spreadsheets and stuff. But that's, I called it like intuitive math, you know, you just get a feel for certain things because of the number of times I've done it. But yeah, right. I'm not sitting down doing, you know, A minus B equals C, not at all. Um, you talked about setting goals, and I guess we talked very briefly about that, but can you talk in a little more detail? Because a lot of people make broad sweeping goals that I feel are like overly fantastic, really, you know, like big, fat, hairy goals. Like, I'm going to be the world's greatest composer. Right. You're probably not, but give us some examples of realistic goals that seem to be working out well for you. Well, I came away from last year's rally 2018 um, after talking to um, you know big time um, big time members with lots of volume like uh, Matt Vanderbilt and Dean Grippane and and um, and I thought okay I'm not really doing the volume of work that seems to be necessary and like that was kind of the takeaway that I got at last year's rally so I set out to do 50 tracks. So I thought that that was a very, um, you know, concrete goal, you know, no adjectives, uh, you know, not just, I'm going to do 50 tracks. In a year? That's in a year, right. Okay. So that's like one a week. That is more than I had done in previous years. So I thought I should be able to do that. I should be able to focus enough and do that. 
So it turns out that in the year I did over a hundred. And um, so I so now so now as you read before I've got a new goal of two hundred and that is already starting to be a problem. But I'm I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna stick with it because uh, I'm I'm already behind. In three weeks I have thirteen tracks. I think that's not enough. But I'm gonna I'm gonna keep on going with it. But wow. I think that well, like what you said is is the, is the key. The, your goals have to be concrete, and they have to be. Um, you have to set them up in such a way that you can um, break them down into smaller increments and actually achieve it. So that's why I thought, okay, 50 tracks makes sense. I can do roughly one per week. Um, you know, it's easy to keep track of. You know, to make sure that I'm doing it. Uh, if I get behind. Um, and then it, maybe it's not so difficult. If I missed a week, I can write two the following week. So, um, you know, I thought that that was what was important. Um, you know, if, I think if your goals are too esoteric, um, then your then their criteria for meeting them is subjective, and you don't know if you're really meeting them or not. So I know concretely how many tracks I wrote. Um, are they good or not? I don't know. But uh, well, I know uh, the them. proof is in the pudding. You're getting forwards right. and you're getting signed. Right. So then, you know, and then so part of that was I'm going to write, I wanted to write 50 tracks. I wanted to get, um, I, based off of how many I had forwarded previously, which was a, a fairly low number, um, I, I really wanted to get to 100 total forwards. Um, I thought that now I don't really know why I came, where I came up with that number. Um, I just thought that was um, I was actually thinking, you know, if I get a hundred forwards and I get no deals and nobody contacts me, I'm gonna I'm emailing Michael to tell him I've had 100 forwards and nothing has happened. But uh, that didn't happen, so uh, I got the hundred forwards, but I got multiple deals along the way. It, it so, happens uh, sometimes. We have a member who's a super nice guy. Uh, and he got 250 forwards and did wow. not get one call back on any of them. And we were all pretty freaked out about it, you know, behind the scenes here at Taxi. You know, we're a pretty um, transparent company. I'm the first to admit that we were worried. But then when I looked at what he had forwarded, the majority, probably like 65 to 70 percent of them were drone cues. The guy did really good drone cues. Well, unfortunately, a lot of people do really good drone cues. So we would run a drone listing and we might send 100 or 200 drone cues to a library oh, wow. and, and we would have to call the library up and go, we're sorry to be sending you this vast amount of stuff, but it's all over the bar. It's all that good. But a library probably needs 10 drone cues, not 200. So mm -hmm. this gentleman was probably forwarded and forwarded and forwarded and the music is sent out um, largely random um we if there's some stuff that's spectacularly good we will put it at the top of the list because we want to use that as the bait if you will to get the listing party on the other end to go wow this stuff's really good i'm going to keep listening um because you know if you put the best stuff in the middle or at the bottom they probably won't get that far not that anything right. we sent was crap it was all over the bar but this poor guy just for whatever reason, the stars weren't lining up. And I, I hate talking about there's luck involved because a lot of your luck comes from your own work. Um, mm -hmm. But finally, a after, you know, he wrote in the nicest way, kind of a complaint in the nicest possible way. And I got involved. And sure enough, shortly thereafter, the guy actually got picked up by a really good library, a small but powerful library. We had nothing to do with that. The guy's probably sitting at home going, yeah, yeah, I made Lasco aware of it. He picked up the phone and called the library owner and said, please sign this guy. Not the case, but 250 forwards. So I'm glad to hear that you started seeing results from 100 that, you know. But, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't I don't know if I would have lasted to 250. That's, that's uh, wow. Yeah. That's quite a few. That's yeah. Quite a few. But yeah, what you said makes sense. I mean, it's just... Um, it, but it just goes back to what you said before as well. It's just a numbers game, which is what I realized uh, about a year ago, is that, you know, we just have to have the volume with the quality, but just keep having it, keep doing more, keep doing more, keep doing more. And then it becomes like a critical mass kind of a thing. I mean, at some point, um, you, you've got enough material, you've got, you know, you get one thing signed, and then it, it kind of explodes from there. Um, I've had... Um, you know, multiple times when what 
the the library heard one track that Taxi sent them, and then they wanted me to uh, wanted to hear other things that I had, and I've gotten I've gotten tracks that were returned from Taxi signed, right? Because um, it, because whatever, because it was what you know the library needed at this time, or you know maybe it didn't quite meet, you know maybe it was under the bar for uh, you know everything else was even better that that Taxi forwarded um, at the time, but. You know, later on, when this happens, you know, it got signed later. So that's um, that, and that can happen more. That's happened more times than I think um, than uh, the tracks that actually got forwarded themselves got signed. You know, with other work that I did got signed through that communication. You know, part of the reason that that happens is sometimes people will submit three things for a particular listing. And we know that there's one that's better than the other two. So we often will send that one because it's the, the clear winner among the three. And mm -hmm. the other two didn't get forwarded. They were pretty darn good. They were respectable. They were probably just over the bar, but not like screaming over the bar like the other one. So we don't train the screeners to think like this, but I've seen it happen where they will take the thing because they're all musicians or former library people or whatever so they're they're probably inserting a little bit of strategic thinking on their part that i'm going to put the guy's best foot forward and let nature take its course after that and it does so i'm glad to hear mm -hmm. that that makes sense i think that when making submissions it makes sense to do that yourself um there's been many times when I thought, you know, I've got, I, maybe I was writing one for a listing and I have another track that I think also is appropriate. I just, I just send you one because I put all my effort into making that one the very best it can be. If I get that forwarded and I get contacted, I can send the other tracks um, or I've got more time to make them better if they're not quite there. So, you know, it's always best to put, like you said, put your best foot forward put all your effort into that one and get it as good as it can be. It, it's a first impression game. You know, that you're looking for, a, as one of our members calls it, a favorable introduction. Mm -hmm. Think of it as a first date, you know. Uh, you're not going to pick your teeth or pick your nose on a first date. You're going to wait until <laughs> you've actually moved in together before you start picking your nose at the dinner table. <laughs> Maybe wow. not the okay. world's best example. but Maybe not. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it makes sense. Yeah, it's all about getting them to respond and go, you know what, Greg? I really like this. Can you do more of that? Yes, I can. Versus your name, say, you know, on a forward sheet three or four times in a disco and going, really? I doubt that anybody's got that much great stuff. I, I think there's a little psychology and obviously each person, you know, deals with that psychological stuff a little differently, both on the sending and receiving end. But there's a little game we all play. You know, in one of the games sure. is certain times when we really, not that we want to nail stuff less on other occasions. Here, here's a good example. For a really big, like $100,000 TV commercial listing, when we forward the stuff, probably two or three of us are going to sit down and go, yep, that one's the winner. That's the one that just nails it. Dead nuts on the money. That is the one. So we'll put that at the top of the list because it sets the tone for that the end user's attitude and be, and willingness to listen to everything else on the list. If there was one that's that good, there's bound to be another one buried in there. So it keeps them listening. Um, mm -hmm. We don't do that every single time because sometimes you get a feeling that it's a bit more of a cattle call and that step isn't necessary. So we try to be more uh, egalitarian about it where, hey, whatever came up first on the list is what is, is forwarded first on the list. Right. Um, yeah, so the, there's all, all this stuff that you learn just from repetitively being in the business of taking care of business. Sure. Well, you mentioned something a little earlier about getting, you know, when you get asked for more material. I mean, that's a really important thing too, which is another reason why you want to stay focused and keep creating because when you do get that communication about um, I like this track, do you have more? You have to have more, yeah. Or you're or you're really shooting yourself in the foot, you know. If 
you know, if, if you if you don't have more at that point, after all the effort that you put in up to that point to get to that spot, um, if you can't move, if you don't have the material to move forward or the ability to create it quickly, um, it's going to really be detrimental. So that's why that's another reason why, like you said too, um, you know, you just have to keep doing it and and you know, find inspiration to just keep writing, write three tracks for a listing, submit your best one, keep the other two you know, refine them a little bit in the background and have them, you know, for the next listing that's similar or for when you get that communication. That's that's really important. Yeah, it's like uh, you finally get the date of your dreams. Use your table manners on the first date. <laughs> you got to take um, advantage of the, the, the few opportunities that you can get. That's right. Um, so you talk about uh, your fourth thing on the list was making a plan to reach your goals and sticking with it. Um, how did you determine what your plan was, how you're going to allocate your time per day, how many things you would do, how many cues you would do in a day or a week or a month? How, how did you, because we can all dream big, but you know, you, you mentioned having a realistic worldview kind of, uh, of what you were capable of doing. How did you figure that out? Yeah, I, I don't know that that was pretty much what it was. I mean, the impetus was to just be realistic, but um, have a little bit of, um, you know, uh, an attempt to do something more than I had ever done in the past. So um, pushing yourself you know, to get out of your comfort zone, but not so far right. that it would make but, it impossible. Right. Because I, that's probably the worst thing you can do. And, you know, if you set a goal that's, that's too lofty that you can't meet, um, then you're just going to give up. I mean, anybody would do that with anything, you know, it only makes sense. So, you know, I tried to, I tried to find that number that was, um, that seemed lofty but reasonable, and I guess for for everybody it's going to be different. Um, you know, I'm I'm lucky enough that I'm I'm dedicating like all of my time to this. So, you know, I I can spend 40 hours a week on on the song if I want to, or more. Um, that I don't, and we'll, maybe we'll get into that a little bit later. But I, I don't spend that much time because if I do, then I, I it's not good enough. But um, I just thought that that was kind of a reasonable amount. And like I said, too, you know, easy to track. Uh, one per week was easy to track. You know, at the end of the week, did I, did I finish one or did I not? Um, that was easy. Now it's getting a little harder because I'm trying to do four. Um, and that's a juggling act. But um, I try to finish one before I move on to the next one. I try to get it in the can and, and move on. Um, if this is too personal, please don't be shy about letting me know that, but you're in the rarefied position, it seems, to not need income from the music now. You're making the long-term bet. You're planning your retirement, uh, as it were. Um, were you the world's highest paid programmer? Did you inherit a crap ton of money? How are you pulling this off? <laughs> well, I, um, I, I, I was a part owner in the company and, and uh, it got sold while I was there. I, huh. Also made a few, luckily wise investments along the way, uh, as well. Um, it's been a long. It's taken a long time though, so uh, you know it's not that new. But I, I realize that most people are not near the position I'm in. Most people are working a full time job and trying to do this. You know, in the evenings, in the mornings. Um, that that's a story I can I I can't understand. Getting up at 4:30 a.m. to write before work. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't think I could have ever done such a thing, but you know, more, more power to people who can do that. That's awesome. Yeah. I think you're talking about Randon Purcell. He gets Randon up. Purcell, yeah. Right. That sorry, dude. Name, I mean, first of all, nicest guy ever, but oh, yeah, he gets up great. at four 30 in the morning every day. And, uh, but you know that's what? It sounds like, uh, you know, you're not a trust fund baby, so nobody should hate on you. Um, but you know, I know from running a company, Companies don't come together accidentally. 99% of the time, it takes a lot of hard work. So if you owned part of a company, you earned that part of that company. And uh, making good investments could have been bad investments. You know, you could have lost your butt. Oh, and there, so, there were a few of those too. So uh, <laughs> there always are. No, I, it, it, it definitely was, um, you know, a slow and gradual process of my own. And I was the first, um, I was the first person in my family to graduate from college. So um, that was, and uh, you know, I probably, 
you know, that that shouldn't have been the case. But, it, you know, like I said, I grew up in Philadelphia. It's a, it's a working class place. So um, everybody takes pride in, in, uh, in that. And, um, you know, I just, I came from a family that was, you know, education was not a big thing for them. It was work hard, work hard, work hard. And uh, eventually, you know, they passed on to me, I should be educated. So I was, and I try to work hard too. Well, it seems to have paid off and congratulations because I know from owning my own small company that uh, you have to scrap for everything you get. You know, people oh, sure. imagine, um, people always say, well, how many members does Taxi have? Because they want to do the math and multiply the number of members times $300. Uh, but they don't think about the, the overhead. You know, the, just the cost of Google AdWords alone is tens of thousands of dollars per month. Oh, just sure. to get people to the website. So, yeah, anybody that's ever thinking about starting a business, it is the greatest thing in the world to determine your own future and live or die by your own sword. Be prepared to work seven days a week. Oh, um, sure. To, to it's earn all, that. It's all, it's all encompassing. Yeah. If you're awake, it's you're everything. working. Yeah. Yeah. It, you have to force yourself not to work. <laughs> right. Well, and that's what I do now. You know, that's what this business is. Um, I'm pretty much doing this all the time, unless I need to go buy some groceries or uh, get some service on the car. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm sitting right here writing music. That's awesome. Um, number five on your list is writing for the listing. And this is, is one of the most, it's one of the keys to success. Mm -hmm. uh, Tell us all about that, writing for the listing versus submitting music you already had sitting around maybe for years. Right. Yeah, that's exactly what I did, just like what many members do. And it's, it doesn't work. And it doesn't work because th those examples are extremely important. That's what you guys get um, to say this is what they want the music to be like. And so you've really got to study what they are and understand uh, what makes them what they are you know what's important about those listings I, I know for me it's it's um it's the tempo of the song it's whether it's in a major or minor key it's whether the production is sparse or dense it's it's the type of synthesizer sounds are they soft and plucky are they brash and buzzy um you know it's not trying to rewrite those songs but it's trying it's picking out those specific elements that make them what they are and use those parameters to write something new and it took oh it took quite a while to get to that point and believe me i'm still learning and still trying to do better at that and still try to stop doing uh stop trying to get old music and say yeah this fits because i still do that and then i get it returned and, and I, I knew i should have done that i should have just written something or put it aside you know that's that's a hard thing to do too um, you know, because the other thing I, I started to do and I backed off is really start flooding submissions with all kinds of stuff. And again, that goes back to the focus thing. Like it, you need to pick out the ones that you've got the best chance of success on and focus on them, work hard on them, submit them, and then move on to the next one that you can do the same with. Um, don't try to spread yourself out too thin because um, you'll just inevitably fail. How do you find that balance? Because earlier you mentioned, you know, the, it's a volume game, which it clearly is. Some people might not hear what you just said. Now, on one hand, it's volume. On the other hand, it's being selective. How do you find the balance between those two? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, that, that that's what I keep. That's what I struggle with you know, most days. If it's, um, like I said, I review the listings every day. I make myself a sub list of what I want to submit to. And then I re-scrutinize that list over and over again. Um, well, we you know, can I really create one for this or just one that I've written really good for this one and just keep, you know, re-evaluating, re-evaluating and narrow it down, um, every day. Um, Number six on your list is study the examples in the listing, which is very yeah. apropos. Uh, we yeah, work, just, I was just talking about that a little bit, yeah. Yeah, we, we work so hard here. I mean, 
there's not a library owner in the industry that wouldn't chuckle with us kind of behind the scenes. The stuff that comes in, the requests from supervisors, um, ad agencies, even library owners, they're, they're weird. <laughs> they're not really as descriptive as what we send our members. And it takes a lot of work to kind of filter to get to the essence of what they're really asking for. Sometimes one mm -hmm. library owner will run into another library owner. It's some industry thing and library owner A says, so anything hot for you guys right now? And library owner B goes, yeah, deep house. We're doing kicking, just kicking butt with deep house. That second library owner may not actually know what Deep House sounds like, and it's just a phrase that got heard around his or her office, and now it's a misused term, and it goes right. from library owner B to library owner A, who picks up the phone or sends taxi and email, find me Deep House. And then they get the Deep House from us and go, this isn't what I was looking for. Well, we sent you Deep House, right. but they got it wrong, and there's a lot of that in the industry. So it's nice to know that you sit down and take the time to like really read the listing. Um, do you have any advice for the people watching this show, uh, like how you specifically ferret out what the core of what is being asked for? Well, I, yeah, like I mentioned, I think that, and it depends, I, it obviously depends on the, you know, on the genre and, uh, and what you're doing, what is important. Like I said, in the, in, in the electronic genres that I'm dealing with, I, I, I think the most important things are, the the tempos and um you know whether it's a major or minor key you know i it always translates um when the listing says you want it to be positive or uplifting right in the major key um, seems obvious doesn't it <laughs> yeah it does but it, well, it wasn't to me even right away I, I absolutely wasn't but um and that's important and then it's, it's very important especially you know if you if what you're doing is hip-hop because what you'll find is Mostly, you know, if you go out and listen to records or, you know, you're listening to your Spotify playlists and stuff, it's all minor keys, heavily minor keys. So um, hip hop with in positive keys is much rare, more rare, um, which might be why it's a little in demand, you know, right now that you can do it. And it's but it's also not easy to do because it can very easily sound a little cheesy. You know, it doesn't have that edge because it's not in a minor key. Right. Um, but um but those are that so that's kind of important. If it's if you say uplifting or positive, it's got to be a major key. If it's gritty or edgy, it should definitely be in a minor key. And you can get that from the listing, you know, by listening to it. And the the other thing too is to listen to um, again in these genres. The production is what is important. Is maybe more than composition. Um, in other genres, obviously, composition is going to be a lot more important. But it, it, it in the electronic stuff and hip hop, it's important uh, whether that production is sparse or dense, you know. It may be that um, you've got uh, a synth playing the chords and a bass playing a bass note and a kick drum, and they all play exactly the same rhythm. So, so the arrangement is it's very, very sparse. It's a lot of open space in it. Um, uh, future bass is like that as well. A lot of open space. Um, tempo is slower, you know, in the 80s as opposed to other EDMs and Deep House and Tropical House and Tropical Pop, which are all up in the you know, 115, 120 type of type of range, but um, or some of those things are very, very dense. You know, you, if you're doing orchestral work and then you're listening for, you know, every instrument an orchestra is used, so that's what you need to do. If it's it's an orchestral thing, you don't want to send uh, piano and violin. You know, that's not going to cut it. It's, right. it's not the same. So, so those kind of things are are really important. Um, but tempo is really important. I mean, I've learned this at the rally. You know, so many times if somebody sends taxi a, a sample of music, um, and I've noticed this, sometimes when you give multiple samples, they're all the same tempo. Um, sometimes they're not, but sometimes they are. And when they are, you know, that kind of makes you think somebody's already temped in one of these tracks. And so they absolutely need the track at that tempo. Right, to match um, the picture. To drop it right in yeah. uh, where they are. Whereas sometimes, you know, you, there might be three tracks and the tempos, are, they vary, you know, in the genre, they might vary, you know, 10 BPMs, 15 BPMs, because it's, uh, you know, it's still appropriate. But um, when they're very similar to each other, um, you want to stick right with that. So that's what I usually do, is I listen to those examples and I start at that tempo. That's the tempo. 
You know, you, you just reminded me of something that in 10 years of doing Taxi TV, I'm not so sure I've ever brought this up before, but you've opened the door and I want to do it. And that is that if you look at the listings carefully, more often than not, maybe 100% of the time, it's certainly over 80% of the time, the listing will say, if we got the references from the listing party, we'll say these less, uh, references mm -hmm. were given to us by the listing party. There are times where we'll find... You know, there can be three listings where two of them are very similar in character, in vibe, sound, production, all those things kind of line up and you go, okay, I get it. And then you hear a third one and go, what the hell? Uh, to which I say, they're telling you that it's a range. They're not looking for a clone of that stuff, but would it fit on a playlist between this one and those guys, those two and this one? Would my thing fit in between them or would it right. you know so when we say in the listing that the the references were given to us by the listing party that gives some assurance to the members that it's not just us sitting around going yeah i think this is tropical pop so yeah you know it's not guesswork we do our best to eliminate the guesswork to make it easier for you guys so you don't have to guess so i'm glad right. you brought that up thank you um, and I try to, you know, I try to, the best I can, I, you know, when there's multiple examples, I try to make kind of an amalgam of what I pick out of each of those. So, you know, if I pick, okay, this is the, the first one, I, I want to start with that tempo. Um, but, I, you know, but the second example really um, relies very heavily on this plucky synth sound. So I'm going to use that. But, um, but maybe rhythmically, I'm doing something more like the third example. And kind of so picking out what is important about those things and um, and putting them all together into trying to make something that's original but similar. Um, are you married and still have your family under the roof? Oh yeah. So do you ever find that uh, have you ever reached out to one of your kids that I'm guessing are now high school age or college age and? Uh, uh, I have two. They're they're 23 and 21 years old. Okay, so do you ever play them your finished track and say, so here are the examples and here's the finished track I did. Do you guys think that this is in that stylistic and vibey, feely ballpark? I do. I usually get to do that when I've got them trapped in the car. Um, <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't usually get to bring them into the room and say, hey, listen to this because they're, they're too busy. But when I trap them in the car, then I make them listen to it. Um, and... Um, I have to say, I don't get the greatest feedback all the time, um, <laughs> mostly because I do music that's different from what they like. Uh, so it's not it's not really what um, they listen to. So um, you know, my one daughter likes the Shins a lot. Wow. Uh, and uh, which turns out to be she liked them from a, quite a while ago, and they happen to be an Albuquerque uh, based band. They're from here. It's a, it's a coincidence. But um, so that's very they're, they're very unlike anything that I do. So it's hard to. Oh, and Regina Spector, my daughter loves Regina Spector. Wow, which is uh, which I think she's great too, um, but also very different from what I might be doing. So they don't quite have the same basis. Now I did pass on a lot of my love of '70s and '80s pop music to them too. So so they do have that basis. So if you ask them about any, you know, Michael Jackson or Earth, Wind and Fire or Stevie Wonder song, they are well versed in that. It's funny. Uh... My, I have a, a daughter who's now 23, but when she was still living at home and probably 16, 17 years old, uh, we would go a few times a year, we would go to uh, Barnes and Noble and I would whip out the company credit card and say, okay, you pick out five CDs of artists you like from your generation and I'll pick stuff out. And we would go sit in my car in the driveway for hours at night together. And, and like she loved Abbey Road. She loved the White Album. She loved Eagles. Uh, of course, that all made me extremely happy, but she turned yeah. me on to a lot of pop that I normally would have changed the station on because, oh gosh, you know, just more mindless beat-driven pop. But right. it totally hit me to the fact that that stuff is intelligently constructed too. Just like people used to poo-poo country music. Oh, you know, it's three chords, pickup truck, beer, and Daisy Dukes. <laughs> 
the same thing can be said for this seemingly disposable pop. There's a lot of craft that goes into it. It's just a different kind of craft. And that's oh, right. craft with FT, not P on the end. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I definitely get exposed to a lot of music that I wouldn't normally have been. Um, some of which I get surprised that I enjoy um, and other I am not surprised that I don't enjoy. <laughs> but that's okay. Um, the seventh thing on your list uh, that you mentioned is efficiency, uh, and that's a really big deal. So can you tell the audience what you've done to become more efficient? Because if you're not efficient, you're going to get bored, frustrated, and give up. So I'm glad that you figured that out and found ways to do it. Well, the, the first thing, I think, um, is the amount of time that I spend on doing a track. Um, and this again is kind of what I roughly developed over a short time, you know, of doing some and what I, what I felt like. I felt like if I didn't have the, you know, the ideas that I needed to put in to make it within an hour, hour and a half or so, then I was beating a dead horse. I was not not going to get there. Um, and many more hours are going to just be wasted. So I really decide within the first hour to two at the most that I've got it and I can finish this or I don't and I should abandon it and start again. Um, and that, is, you know, that is kind of the key to really getting quite a bit done because um, as most members don't have as much time as I seemingly have, as we've talked about, uh, to do, get, to get stuff done, um, you just don't have time to waste and to get, you know, quality work done. So you really got to get your ideas down, know that they're good or know that they're not and move along if they're not. So I, I spend in total about, I would say about four to five hours on, on each track from inception to it's mixed, it's done, and I'm not going to listen to it anymore. I'm moving on to the next thing. Um, and I usually, I usually do that like, um, where um, you know I will it, say I will start my track. I feel like I finished it. Um, I will then put it aside. Next morning I will listen to it and say, uh, you know what? I I made the bass really really loud. I made the or uh, these finger snaps are not loud enough. I'll run out to my car or when I'm driving around listen to it. I'll come back. I'll tweak it up. Then it's done and then I move on to the next one. I got a new car over the weekend and I sat in the driveway nice. last night for about an hour trying it's I I'm too cheap to pay for an upgraded stereo but this car was such a good deal and it happened to come with an, a Harman Kardon stereo in it and I can't make the stereo sound good in that car it, it's like oh. the the bottom end is so kind of whoomp you know it's just like this big round bottom the days, uh, and I even um, put a, a Steely Dan CD in there, which I think has a pretty true bottom. And it's just, they now make the stereo so colored that it's hard to make it sound like what we're used to working in mixing environments. I mean, not that NS10s are some panacea of beautifulness. They're not. Maybe that's why, you know, they're so popular is they're fairly boring speakers that make you work a little harder. But I've seen the... Not sure if I dropped you, Michael. Oh, okay. Or if you hear what I'm saying? Yeah, I can hear you. I stopped hearing what you're saying. Oh, okay. Um, that's weird. Can you hear me? Okay, Bria. Yep, yeah, Bria's hearing me. Um, sign language. <laughs> he can't hear me. Oh no. Uh, should be good. I mean, I'm still seeing myself. Can the audience still hear me? Yeah, the audience is saying they yes, still... I can hear you. Okay, Bria can hear me and the audience can hear me. Nothing? Hmm. I haven't changed any settings here. Yeah, everybody says they can... You still can't hear me. I guess if he could. He Did his... Maybe his ear earbuds disconnected or something. Hmm. Um, yeah, because if we didn't change anything, oh, I think he left and is coming back. Here, give me a sec. Really? It happened when you... No, it's not. 
Oh, it just coincidental. Yeah. Okay. Can you hear him now? Can you hear me now? Okay, cool. So it wasn't us. Okay, cool. I don't know, but I'm going to trademark that phrase I just came up with. Can you hear me now? <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> wow. Okay. Well, glad we got that worked out. Yep. Yeah. Oh, all, can you all is click good. Click on him and then click the. Where down here? Him, and then click that. Okay, click on him, and click that. Okay, cool. Cool, thanks. All right, we are all good. Okay, um, good. And wow. Okay, there we go. Um, let's see. We're talking about. Uh, the efficiency. I lost you. I lost you when you were talking about your car not getting the sound to sound good. Oh, they they make stereos sound so pretty. Um, ooh, I'm getting a lot of CPU usage too. It's red, redlined. Um, they make car stereos sound so pretty now that it's hard for me in the newer cars to judge what sounds good anymore so uh i actually have a pair of headphones that i like and that that's my listening environment now is checking it on headphones um that makes sense i usually just check i usually just go out to the car to check the low end you know if i if i've made it if it's too boomy in the car then it's too boomy because they've over you know most systems are kind of overhyped yeah in that way Yep, they ought to just put a pair of NS10s on the back shelf and a Macintosh tube amp in the trunk and just be done with it. <laughs> <laughs> no low end at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, Nothing below 60 or 70 hertz. Yeah, you know, it's funny. My car uh, has a graphic equalizer in it. And so I started by pulling up the graphic EQ and just taking 100 and dumping it all the way down and then 200 and dumping that all the way down. And there was still too much bottom end in the car. Wow. So I finally figured out that taking 200 and 500 down all the way and moving 100 back up to like 30 percent, um, then peaking just a smidge at 2.5K, 5K and eight or 10 K that kind of made it work, but it's still not that good. Oh, well, you know what? Truth be told, my commute is about 10 minutes each direction. Most of the time I just sit there in silence and I'm happy that I'm not on a telephone and not listening to music. I'm 10 minutes all to myself. <laughs> yeah. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah. And that's why I don't like paying for the upgraded stereo because I never use it, but sometimes you just have to suck it up. Um, number eight on your list is persistence and it's probably everybody thinks they're persisting um, and only those who actually persist are persisting. <laughs> I, I think it's an, <laughs> it's an overused word. Tell us about your right. persistence quotient. Well, yeah, it's just about, um, you know, getting returns and keep doing it anyway um, and learning from them. Um, you know, that's, that's kind of really important, which I guess we didn't really talk about just yet, is um, I've, I've definitely um, learned from the feedback that I got um, why something's returned and, and really absorbed that feedback and not take it personally. You know, that's another thing that's really difficult. Um, when, as you know, as everybody listening knows, you creating art is very personal, so it's very difficult to not take it personally if somebody doesn't like it. Uh, you know, you expect or you want everybody to like it, but you've really got to try your best to put that aside, to put those feelings aside and really accept any kind of criticism and attempt to implement what that, that criticism is. You know, this track is too fast, this track is too slow, um, you know, it doesn't go anywhere, um, it's too long, it should have been shorter, it's too short, it should have been longer. These are the kind of things that you, you can implement and then invariably uh, uh, another listing will come up with, with similar criteria that you can submit it to. And I've done that multiple times and had things that were returned, uh, corrected what, what was criticized about it and, and got it forwarded the second time. Do you um, find that most of the time the screeners are giving you something valuable as a takeaway? Um, most of the time, yeah, most of the time. Yeah, sometimes, I, I, sometimes not, um, and it's hard because I guess sometimes it's 
maybe it's just that, that, that something you can't really quite put your finger on what is it that is not quite right about this track or it's not good enough. I guess that that might happen when you've got so many great tracks um, and, you know, just mine doesn't meet the bar. So it's just not it's not close enough. You know, yeah. if it's it's 101 on a list of 100. Yeah, we tell them, uh, you yeah, know, look, it's not a comparative thing. We don't want them to be influenced by what they heard a minute ago or two hours ago. Uh, each track has to stand or each song and or track has to stand on its own merits. And our advice to them is don't think back to that one you really liked three songs ago. Reread the listing and go, does it meet this listing requirement? And you're right, sometimes something will meet all the requirements, but if we had 10 people in a room, eight out of the 10 would probably say, yeah, it meets the requirements, but it just doesn't have that thing. And sometimes screeners will return something based on its it's just not grabbing me. And I know right. nobody who creates music wants to hear that, but the library owners are looking for that too because they want their end users, the music supervisors or editors, to feel drawn into that thing. So even though something meets the criteria, it might not get forwarded. This doesn't, I don't think it happens much, but I can imagine, I'm being transparent here, I can imagine that it does happen. So. Right. You know, I, I don't want people to think, oh, so I met all the criteria, but you didn't forward me. Well, maybe the unsaid criteria or the unsaid thing on the list is, does it grab you? Does it move you? We overuse the word compelling in the listings, but that's what it's got to do it is, okay, it meets the criteria. Does it also compel you to like it? Does it compel you to want to hear it again? Does it compel you to tap the person in the next cubicle and shoulder and go, man, you got to listen to this. This is really cool. And that does happen. So the compelling factor is definitely something that comes into play. Yeah. It's hard to make it compelling if you didn't uh, in the first right. place. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Well, you know, and the, the, the other criticism, I think that, well, I'm sorry, the other feedback that comes back a lot, and I hear you mentioned this many times, uh, other members mention this all the time, is that the sounds that you use are not current. Right. Um, and, um, you know, that is a, that is definitely a mountain to get over. Um, it is hard because um, you can very easily get locked into what you're using or, you know, you think that it sounds good, but you, you've really got to, like we were talking earlier, you've really got to listen to the examples and what is, what is making that sound the way it sounds and attempt to emulate it the best way that you can? Um, you know, with, with what kind of bass is there? What kind of synths are there? What kind of drums are there? And you can't just pull up, a, you know, any old drum machine sounds that you've got. You know, they've got to be what are in those examples. And and that changes. That's, that's what's really difficult, I think, is that you know, the, the window in which, the time window in which that changes is getting narrower and narrower. You know, yeah. Do something, you know, last year and say, oh, that's so 2018. That, that's not what we're looking for. Um, but um, but that, that can easily happen. So you have to keep listening and listening and listening and, and be able to implement what you hear. This morning sure. when I woke up at 10 minutes to 6, I had the alarm set for 7, but woke up at 10 to 6. And... My wife was sleeping. She was wearing an eye mask and earplugs because um, I like to stay up late and watch TV in bed or work on the laptop. So she's learned to block me and my life out. <laughs> uh, so I turned on the TV this morning after attempting to go back to sleep. I couldn't. And I can't remember if it's on HBO or Showtime. It was called Hitsville, colon, The Making of Motown. Oh, my gosh one of the greatest music documentaries I've ever seen. It just made me want to not go to work today, instead go into the studio and work. But it made the point over and over and over again about the quantity of music they cranked out, the collaborative nature of everything that went on under that roof, mm -hmm. and that they would actually bring music, routinely bring music into like a company-wide meeting with maybe 10, 20, 30 people, right? From receptionist to could have been the person who, you know, cleaned the kitchen. Anybody who was in the building, they put them all in a room and had them write down their thoughts. And if a particular song didn't make it through that test, 
they didn't make a record with it, you know. Uh, it, I'm assuming they were listening to demos. Maybe sometimes they were listening to masters with Smokey mm -hmm. Robinson singing and going, nope, that's not your hit, Smokey. Not good enough. But man, <laughs> everybody watching this show, go watch Hitsville, The Making of Motown. You will be so inspired. And uh, I feel fortunate we've had uh, Lamont Dozier as an honoree at the Road Rally some years ago. Boy, what a special man that guy is. And we had um, Brian, uh, Brian Holland also at the Road Rally. So we've had two thirds of Holland Dozier and Holland at Road Rallies. Man, for any of us that think we're really good at something, be humble <laughs> because we're not as good as those guys. <laughs> Uh, as Lamont said to me on stage at the road rally, uh, it, he's one of the few people I actually believed when he told me something like this. He said, sometimes I feel like I just, the top of my head was lifted off and God just poured these songs into me. The sincerity in that man's eyes when he told me that, I 100% believed him. He's one of maybe two people in my lifetime I've met that it wasn't so much work as it was being blessed with just that much raw talent. And uh, most of the time, it's just hard work and, and honing one's craft. For him, it's sitting on the back steps of his aunt's um, hair salon, uh, hearing two women, you know, before they put the hair dryers on, talking about their cheating husbands, and he turned that into a song. <laughs> I love that. Well, song. it's you know, I guess what it really takes, Michael, is both. You know, you need yeah. to have all of that inspiration and talent, and the willingness to hone the craft. Because if you don't. Only one half of that is not good enough. You know, you've got to do both. Great observation. Thank you for saying that. Um, number nine, patience. It's the long <laughs> game, a very long game. Don't expect yeah. fast results. Those are your words. Expound on that, please. Yeah. Well, I, I heard, um, at, and I don't know how I didn't run into him earlier, but at this year's rally, I heard... Uh, and I hope I don't mispronounce his name. Is it uh, Chuck Schlachter? Is that how yeah, you say it? Yeah, got it right. Chuck Schlachter, um, who said that he joined in 2006, got first song signed in 2008, got first royalty check in 2011. So, um, so that could turn a lot of people off, that timeline. Uh, yeah. You know, because that takes quite a lot of patience and persistence, no matter how good you are. Um, the timeline that that's really what the timeline is going to be um so you have to just accept it and you have to be you know the the kind of person that can wait that out um and keep going and keep going and not need and not expect immediate gratification but know that if you keep putting in the time you keep putting in the effort and you keep improving um you know that that will come eventually all the way down that road four or five years out but it's it, hard. Yeah, it's I a lot to expect. You know, I don't and I think get I it. have a. Um, I don't think I have advice to tell people how to be patient. Uh, <laughs> just that you need to be patient, and not expect it all to come right away. It's not to say that that's not possible. I'm sure that that's possible. Um, but um, but that's not that, that's not the story. They're not the overwhelming story that successful people say. It's a it's a slow and steady trod. From you know to the along the way, it's it not blows, a quick hit. Blows my mind. Uh, I signed all I, I sign all the refund checks here um, every month, and it, it's amazing to me how many people say I didn't make my three hundred dollars back in my first year of taxi membership. Mm -hmm. Can I please have a refund? And I just want to call them up and you know figuratively smack them upside the head. Go, what the hell were <laughs> you thinking? You know, could you become a pro golfer in a year? Uh, and probably giving it, you know, a weaker effort than you should have as well. Um, could you become a ballerina, a first chair of violinist, uh, an astronaut? Anything that requires patience, persistence, and a, to reach the level of where you could say, I'm accomplished at this, it all takes time. And for some reason, people think that one year is the magic number. One year of a half-assed effort is, is the magic formula. <laughs> Not at all. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's been floating around the internet, but I think it's pretty true. I mean, it's, it's got to take you at least 10,000 hours to become good at anything. Um, and then you can't do 10,000 hours in one year. Um, nope. No. So, I've uh, tried. <laughs> it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't think it's possible. 
Um, not on this planet. Maybe if you went to a different one with a different rate, you might do it, but <laughs> right. not here. So it's going to take many, many years for you to become really, really good enough at anything at all uh, to become successful at it. Amen. So um, be, lot of, be prepared to spend a lot of time and, and, uh, and wait for it. And, for sure. and you know what? We're talking about, in most cases, we're talking about your future. Um, I would say the majority of taxi members are, are over 30 years old. Probably the median age is probably 38 to 40 years old. And you know what? Uh, retirement age comes up a lot quicker than one would expect. And I just heard uh, a statistic that I'm probably quoting a little bit wrong, but I think the average amount, uh, the median amount of money Americans have in the bank at any point in time is like 45 or $4,800 or something like that. It'd be really scary to get to be 65, 70 years old want to retire and have five grand, 10 grand, no grand in the bank. And this is absolutely a way to do it uh, with your music. And you could create an income that is ongoing and growing. And when you get to retirement age, once you retire, then you've got more time to water those plants, plant the seeds, prune, prune the plants, fertilize them, all that stuff, figuratively speaking, of course. Yeah. And um, you should be better at it by then. <coughs> Yeah, so it breaks my heart. I don't get angry at people that want a refund after one year. I feel heartbroken for them that they've missed the opportunity to secure retirement doing something that they love doing anyway. It's just dopey to me. Yeah, you just, like I said, I'm a math guy. So I know that I've spent quite a bit of money uh, since I first joined. And, um, yeah, that's not going to come back anytime soon. Uh, it's going to be a while. It's still going to be quite a while. But, but it it's will. out there. It, but it will. it will. Yeah. It will. You know, I, I have no road. idea how much Chuck Schlachter makes per year with his music. I know that he's a certified financial planner. Um, mm -hmm. so that's a full-time job, I'm sure. Um, he takes the music stuff very seriously, and he is probably our most vocal member about it's the long game. It's a marathon, not a sprint, he always says. Yeah. If I had to guess, I would say that now, you know, he's probably in the multiples of tens of thousands of dollars a year in income. Just a total guess on my part. But that didn't happen in a year. It probably took him, uh, you know, I would say five years to break the five or $10,000 mark. And then it does get, the money grows more quickly after five, six, seven years. Uh, there, I don't know if it's logarithmically or what the math no, what the math terminology would be. Exponentially. Exponentially, thank you. Yeah, um, you it are. does. <laughs> you, you get to a point where you go, wow, this is real. And then maybe you experience a dip because you relaxed a little bit or just fate would have it. But all the people, literally 100% of our successful members have all shared the same thing with me where it was like nothing, nothing, a little taste, a little promise, then a little more. Oh, look at that. Third year, I made a thousand or two thousand bucks. Wow, I just paid for my membership for all those years previous. And then around year five, it's like four thousand, five thousand, six thousand. And then it starts becoming exponential after that. And once you're in right. like eight to 10 years, you go, holy crap, I'm so glad that I didn't give it up, you know, after year number one. Mm -hmm. so. um, all right, let's talk about your, your 10th thing on your list is under promise and over deliver. I'm a big fan of that. So tell your fellow members well, and taxi TV viewers all about that. Yeah, it's it's not just music related. It's something that I learned a long time ago and that I try to do in everything I do, um, which is, I mean, it's quite literally under promise and over deliver. So just say what you can do, be reasonable about it, and then do it maybe exceed your expectations just a little bit. So if you think that, you know, so if um, you get, uh, I, I do custom writing, I have, I'm signed with a library that I do custom writing for, and they, they usually ask me to write something with about two to three days notice. Mm -hmm. um, so I will say, um, okay, I will have that for you at the end of the day, on the day that you asked for it. And then I send it in the morning because um, that just reflects more positively on me. Um, it says, I'm focused on what you've asked me to do. 
uh, I'm, I'm willing to do what you ask and spend the time doing it, um, and that I can do what I promise. You know, that's, that's important. Um, obviously, doing the opposite of that is extremely harmful to your career in any way. So if you say, I'm going to have it for you at the end of the day on Friday, and you don't have it until Monday, um, you're not going to be asked to do anything probably again. That's right. Uh, by under by under promising and over delivering, what you do is you keep yourself on the list of go to people, and that's where mm -hmm. you want to be. That list is so important. Absolutely, and you have to know yourself. So you you know you want to make sure that you don't over promise because, especially early on, it's you um, you know you can get so enthusiastic that you that you over promise people. You you spread yourself out and you say, yeah, I can do that, and then you can't. So. Um, you just don't want to do that. You got to be reasonable. Um, I don't think anyone asking you to do anything is going to be, uh, you know, not receptive to reasonable uh, uh, limitations. You know, so um, if you can't, like, if somebody wants you to do something by tomorrow and you can't, don't say you can if you can't. Say right. you can't. Uh, um, it, it's a blessed day when you can say, I'm sorry, I'm working on another project for another library. They won't hate you for that. They'll appreciate the honesty and yeah. they'll walk away going, he's a hot commodity because he's doing something yeah. for another library. So you, you win yeah. twice. <laughs> yeah, you, you're definitely better off being honest, saying no, um, because you'll, you'll still get the next call, even if, you, even if you said no, because it was reasonable. Um, but if you, um, if you say yes and you don't meet it, you won't get the next call. And, and you know what? If you don't, don't waver. Don't go, well, you know, I might. Because uh, yeah. just the tone of your voice spells indecision. And that's mm -hmm. not something that an end user wants to hear from you. They would much rather have you say a heartfelt, I'm so sorry. I'm working on another project for another library. And I really appreciate the fact that you reached out to me in this. I promise I will do everything I can the next time to give you what you need when you need it. Thank you for reaching out. You give them that speech and they will reach out again. I, I ran into almost that exactly. Well, not exactly, but very, very similar. Just this year, um, I, wrote a, I wrote a custom piece uh, and um, the library didn't get right back to me about it, um, but they usually get back to me and maybe want me to touch something up here or there, uh, maybe make a different mix, something like that. Uh, I think I delivered it to him like on a Monday. It was the week of the rally. I, uh, I left to come to the rally. And um, when I arrived in Los Angeles, I had an email from the library. Hey, can I change such and such about the mix? And um, I had to say no. I had to say yeah. I, I can't do it until Monday because yeah. I'm, I'm in Los Angeles. It's not physically possible. And but because previous interactions, I, I, I met all of the, all of the things that I promised, then it, it made sense that I couldn't do it this one time. And what I did was I said I would do it Monday. So Monday morning, I mean, I got, I got in about midnight, Sunday night from, wow. from, from Los Angeles. Monday morning, I got up and I made that change first thing and sent it to them probably before, cause I'm an hour later. So probably before they were going to hear it there in LA. Um, and that's just kind of the way you have to operate in order to be successful. And I, I kind of think that that's like the minimum, the bare minimum of what you need to do. Like you've, if you've gotten to the point where you're writing music that is good enough and you're writing enough of it that, you know, that, that, it, that it's in multiple libraries and people are asking you for stuff, you, at the very least, you've got to just do what you say and be reasonable about it and, and execute because otherwise you're not you're just not going to be in this business for very long. And I've you're got, really you're really shooting yourself in the foot if you've gotten to the point if you've gotten to that point and then you fail to meet um, it's really bad when you fail to meet what you promise and that's where the the statement comes from, you know. Just don't promise what you can't do. I've got to say promise. I don't want to make this about me, but I'm taking your point and making it about me for a minute uh, in regard <laughs> to the road rally. Uh, I don't think even my, my family or the staff understands how much pressure I put on myself every year to make the road rally so much better than the one previous. And that's my personal little quest is because I, I could phone it in 
Uh, but I don't want to phone it in because I am so unbelievably loyal and impressed by and feel beholden to, especially the people that come from the other side of the world. Every time I meet somebody mm -hmm. at the road rally who says they're from Australia or China or Singapore, uh, you know, I'll take a minute and say, I just want to thank you for coming that distance. And it's my goal to not let you down. Um, so I, I get that. It, it's, you know, you could probably phone in some pieces, but you always want to try to do your best, even though it saps your energy. It, it's, um, it's hard. It's just hard. But you know oh, what? The, the reason the Road Rally keeps getting rave reviews is because that's the standard I hold myself to. I think the staff lives up to that standard. And in the end, you guys walk away going, wow, this one was better than the last one. Those are magic words to my ears. So It always has been. It has been in my experience. And I don't plan to. I plan to come every year, no matter what. There's, there's no reason to not come. It's only, it's, only positive. it's only a positive experience, everything about it. Well, you have been an amazingly great guest today. Uh, I, I can't thank you enough, first of all, for sending a compelling letter that <laughs> that made us pick you. And uh, you, you've been a perfect guest. I mean, you're articulate, heartfelt, and, and just everything that's come out of your mouth today was 100% valuable. So thank you for that. Um, I want to do you, a quick little commercial at the end before I, I give you a virtual hug. <laughs> One of our members, right before the road rally, and I, I didn't have time to look up the gentleman's name today, but the name of the company is Aqua Pop Popcorn. It's aquapoppopcorn.com. I'm not getting paid for this. Um, he sent us a big box of flavored popcorn for the staff to eat during the road rally with an apologetic note that said, my little popcorn company in Kansas is, is taking off. And I can't break away to come to the road rally. Well, as a former business owner yourself and me being a, a current business owner, I understand that. But I've got to tell you, the staff and I have been so impressed with the, the number of flavors and the quality of the flavors in this popcorn. I'm doing this little commercial just because the product is so good we're not get we got a little free popcorn but we're not getting any money out of this i gotta tell you there's one flavor that was called loaded baked potato that every bite of that popcorn tasted exactly like a loaded baked potato so they've got all these savory flavors um all, all these sweet flavors they've got one that's like uh Oh, you know, it's like caramel, salt, nuts. It's, it's like when you get one of those pre-made ice cream cones in the freezer section of your gas station. Uh, just mind-blowing. So um, Bria is probably, I think she's searching right now to put that link up. I don't also, know if they have a website yet. Uh, they do. It's, maybe I'm not saying it right. Um, Aquapoppopcorn.com. There's two P's in the middle. Aquapoppopcorn.com. Uh, not set up yet. Oh, the website doesn't exist yet. Okay. Yeah, so it's out there, but they're opening soon. All right. The so phone. Launched, the yeah. phone number is four zero two, two four one, nine zero zero eight. That number again, in Wayne, Nebraska, is four zero two two four one nine zero zero eight. And the reason I'm bringing this up is we all have that moment where we go, oh crap, I don't know what to get so and so. So call that number, Aquapop Popcorn, and, and order some of this and send it to them. Trust me, they will love you. They will get fat, but they will love you as they're getting fat. Uh, also, can you put up Greg's website so people can go hear his music and hear the, the labor of his, or the, the result of his hard work? That's what I'm trying to say. Um, some of that. <laughs> Seriously, well, Michael, Greg. I, can, I want to say to you, I. I want to say thanks for everything that you do. Uh, um, even going back to creating Taxi, I know that um, I, I saw ads for Taxi when I used to read Keyboard Magazine in the, in the 90s. So, uh, you know, it just took me about 15 years to think about it. <laughs> but um, I, I, wouldn't be, uh, I wouldn't be a composer. I wouldn't be in this industry because I wouldn't have any idea where to begin, who to cold call. It just wouldn't work. Um, so thanks Thanks for what you do and thanks for taxi existence so that I and many people have um, a place to go to, to, to get a small foothold into this industry. It's awesome. Well, thank you for saying that. Uh, I really, really deeply appreciate that because 
believe me, there are days, you know, I've been doing it for, it'll be 28 years in January. And like everybody, there are days you just go, there's got to be something else I can do with my life. I need something new or different. But you know what? When I hear, when I hear stories like yours um, or so many of our members, it's like, wow, I, I get to put food on the table for my family by making other people's lives better and helping them live their dream. And, you know, there have been people that have accused Taxi of selling a dream. We're not selling a dream. We're helping, we're selling the tools and the access to help people achieve their dreams. And all they have to do is take it seriously and give it the effort, which you clearly have. And I so appreciate you spending the time prepping, you know, doing your prep work for this show and taking the time to talk to our members today. Uh, you've been a fantastic guest and this is encouraging me to reach out to other people because oh yeah i can say it all day long but i own the company and i understand that you know the, it's just so much better to hear it from somebody that's in the trenches doing it so greg yeah. carosa um thank you um next time I'm, I'm in albuquerque taking you out for a really nice dinner i owe you a oh, solid buddy no problem thank we'll you get some green um, chili cheeseburgers <laughs> Sounds awesome, <laughs> my kind of food. With that, I'm going to sign off. Uh, we will see all of you next week for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live. Our guest next week is Ronan Chris Murphy. And with that, it's adios. Bye-bye time. Greg Perosa, thank you once again. Appreciate it, buddy. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>